Howdy folks! In this video we're going to have a look at an Ivor Johnson large frame safety automatic hammer revolver. The revolver in this case being the third model of that uh, particular type of revolver. Ivor Johnson manufactured these revolvers from 1894 up until 1941 and they made them in two frame sizes. The large frame, which is what this one is, in 38 Smith & Wesson and also in the uh, small frame in 32 Smith & Wesson. So this is the bigger of the two. The small frame ones are significantly smaller than this. Um, these were sold primarily as a self-defense type revolver. As you can see it's a very compact layout. This one has a three and a quarter inch barrel so it made for a, you know a fairly concealable revolver for people who are looking for a self-defense firearm back in the, those days gone by. And as I mentioned, uh, it's chambered for the 38 Smith & Wesson, which is basically, uh, here's a, an empty cartridge case, 38 Smith & Wesson is most commonly loaded with a 146 grain lead round nose bullet uh, at a very moderate velocity, a little less than 700 feet per second when fired out of a compact revolver such as this one. As I mentioned, Ivor Johnson manufactured uh, three different variations of this particular style of revolver. They uh, manufactured the first type from 1894 until 1895 and the first model, the first variation um, basically used a single block on the top to lock the frame and the barrel extension together. The second and third models used this double type lock and the third model, which is what this is, uses a coil mainspring underneath the grips. We'll take the grips off later to show you that and it also uses a slightly different uh, rear sight and latch and that was designed to make the revolver safer for use with smokeless powder loads. You will want to avoid shooting uh, smokeless powder loads through the first two variations of these revolvers. And even with the third variation, such as this one, I would, uh, I would caution you against extensive shooting of these old guns because they are getting pretty old. Um, spare parts are going to be difficult to impossible to, to obtain. So if you're going to shoot one of these, get it checked out by a competent gunsmith and uh, limit the use to just a, you know, a few rounds here and there. Don't go out and shoot the hell out of them because they really are old and uh, as an antique you should treat them with a, you know, the kind of caution and respect due to something that's, that's quite old. This particular revolver is finished in the nickel finish. Uh, it's not chrome plated. It's uh, nickel. If you had a chrome, anything chrome plated nearby to compare this to, you would see that the nickel is much more of a yellowy looking uh, finish. And the nickel is in actually pretty good shape on this particular gun. There's, you know, there's a few little spots where it's, it's not great, but on the most part, it's in quite good condition. I would say that this particular revolver spent most of its life sitting in a drawer somewhere and the scuffs it got was probably from banging around in a drawer with other things. I doubt it really was fired very much at all. For an old design, these were um, ahead of their, uh, their day in, in some regards. They used uh, a safety feature which was only copied later on in the 20th century by some of the other gun companies. Particularly uh, Ruger made a lot of the transfer bar system that they used on their revolvers and these old Ivor Johnsons actually pioneered that type of system. Now if you look at the if you look at the hammer you can see that there in fact is no firing pin on the hammer. The firing pin is actually mounted on the frame. Now that's a pretty common feature nowadays but back then that was not a common feature. You'll also see this portion here, this lever that sticks up, and that's a transfer bar. Now, what this means is the revolver has to have the trigger completely pulled to the rear for the transfer bar to transmit the blow from the hammer to the firing pin to discharge the cartridge. So you can see with the trigger pulled all the way, put my hand behind it there, you can see the firing pin sticking out. There's the firing pin right there, and it's sticking out of the breech face. Now, if you cock the revolver and for some reason you let the hammer down without having pressure on the trigger, it will not fire. 
And what this really, uh, really means is that with the gun in this position here, with the action in this position, the firing pin and the hammer are separated by the fact that that transfer bar has dropped down into the way. So basically, this portion of the hammer is sitting on the back of the frame. And that means the gun cannot discharge in this position. Ivor Johnson in their advertising at the time made much of their, uh, they called it the hammer of the hammer. They used to show a picture of somebody striking the hammer with a carpenter hammer and you could not get the firearm to discharge by hitting the hammer that way. So that meant if the gun was dropped and it landed on the hammer, it would not fire. So this is basically uh, an early form of uh, mechanical safety system. So that's where the term safety in, their, in the revolver's name comes from. It's that internal safety. So that was, as I mentioned, copied uh, later on by firms such as Ruger for their uh, obviously more advanced designs, but this is an early example of that type of internal safety, safety mechanism. The other thing about the name of this gun which is misleading is the fact that it's called uh, the Safety Automatic Hammer Gun. Now they did make a hammerless version of this with a, a shrouded over hammer, but what we're going to talk about as far as this, the uh, automatic uh, part is the fact that it's not an automatic in the uh, the modern concept as in an automatic or semi-automatic uh, handgun. The automatic refers to the automatic ejection of the spent cases. So you can see when I open the gun up, the extractor star rises up to throw out the empty cartridge cases. So we've got some, some uh, fired brass here. This is not loaded ammunition obviously, it's fired brass. And we're going to put those in the cylinder. And then we're going to close it up and we'll just show you what what that means. There's a hinge right here on the bottom of the frame and it's got an ejection, it's got a cam on it basically which cams that extractor star out. So you can see as the gun is opened up it lifts up the cartridge cases and that automatic extraction is what the uh, the company was talking about when they called it an automatic. So Further to the uh, transfer bar system if you look at the trigger guard and the trigger here you'll notice at the very back there's a little uh, little tab here the lights reflecting off it right by my finger and that is the uh, transfer bar that's the bottom of the transfer bar so basically the trigger has to come back and actually push that transfer bar up to get it to transmit the blow of the hammer to the firing pin so just thought I'd point that little feature out Let's have a look at some of the markings on the gun and how clearly we'll be able to see those because of the uh, reflection off this nickel plate. The nickel plating was the most common finish for these firearms. There are some blued ones around. Usually you'll see the nickel plated ones and they'll be kind of in rough shape. The plating has a tendency to peel if there's been any amount of use on them but yeah, we'll see how close we can get to the camera here. I think that's readable right there. You can see it says Ivor Johnson's Arms and Cycle Works, Finchburg, Massachusetts, USA. And you can see it's a very thin, very, very thin blade front sight. This one's actually a little bit bent. It must have been dropped at some point in time. There's a ding by the muzzle. So this one's obviously gotten a bit of a blow. So it's got a half moon type blade front sight. The rear sight is a very, very strange sort of a setup. It's pretty hard to pick up. I'll put my hand in front of it just to show you what the sight picture looks like. But there's what the uh, sight picture is. As you can see, it's, a, it's not much of a sight picture. It's very hard to pick up in a hurry. But as uh, a buddy of mine said, he said these, these are the kind of handguns that are designed for gunfights at bar stool distances, not for target shooting. So uh, You can use the sights, but they are kind of fussy. And I'll give you a look at the other side of it here. As I mentioned, it's a nickel finish. However, the trigger guard and the hammer are blued. Actually, it's more of a case hardening on the, uh, the trigger guard and the, uh, and the hammer. The partial serial number is on the trigger guard. The full serial number is on the frame underneath the grips. One other way to tell if this is a third model or a second model 
is by the Owl that you see on the grips here. On the third model, the Ivor Johnson Owl is looking basically direct, directly at you. If this was a second model, the Owl appears to be looking towards the muzzle of the gun. And these are, uh, these are a hard rubber grip, almost like a, a vulcanized rubber grip. They feel almost like plastic, but they are in fact not plastic. So these grips, this one's in good shape. Unfortunately, this one has a chip out of it. Uh, it's about the only real defect that the gun has. And if you look very closely at the bottom of the grip there, we might be able to see where it's got the patent, uh, patent pending, August 20... 23rd, 96. So that gives you an idea of how far back the technology on these guns goes. And it is, of course, a five-shot revolver. And you can see at the front of the breech face, there's actually a bushing screwed in here for the firing pin. So there would be a spanner required to unscrew that if you had to do some work on the firing pin. And you can see the lock. There's the, the, hand, the hand here which advances the cylinder. You can see the hand there. You can also see the, the lock which pops into place when the gun is going to be fired. Alright, to remove the grips you're going to need a properly fitting hollow ground screwdriver with a proper bit. And I've already unscrewed the screw here. And that's just a one screw arrangement which has a brass insert in each grip. And uh, once you've got that screw out, it's just a simple matter of taking each grip panel off. And uh, we get to see something here which is fairly important, which is the coil type mainspring. Um, if this was a leaf spring, that would mean it was either a first or a second model. Um, the coil spring indicates that it is a third model and therefore it is safer to use with smokeless powder modern ammunition. The full serial number of the gun is stamped on the grip frame. The other locations for the serial number is a partial stamping on the trigger guard and also a partial stamping on the top strap underneath the cylinder. So we're going to show you how to remove the cylinder which is a convenient feature for uh, cleaning and for maintenance. We're going to have a close up here at the very front of the cylinder where the cylinder rotates. Now if I rotate around you can see there's a notch there. You can see that notch. Well that notch is the disassembly notch. So to dismount the cylinder rotate that notch so that it's in the 12 o'clock position. So directly underneath the barrel. Then you want to pull back the cylinder latch and with that latch out of the way you can just pull the cylinder right off and that gives you complete access to the cylinder so that you can do your cleaning of the cylinder underneath the extractor, ejector star and also in around the breech face or sorry the, uh, the face of the, uh, the barrel. You can see the other location for the partial serial number is stamped right here. So if you come across one of these old guns and you want to see whether it's matching numbers You've got those three locations which you can check the frame, the trigger guard, and the underside of the top strap. So to put the cylinder back on, it's just a simple matter of, once again, pulling the, the latch out of the way and set the cylinder back in the tube, drop it down, and then turn it till it, the, line, the notch lines up and falls into place. And that's all you got to do. So very straightforward. And the grips of course just go back on the way they come off. So the last part of this video is just going to be a quick uh, trip to the range with a little bit of shooting. I put a couple of cylinders of uh, old Dominion brand ammunition through it. And uh, like I said I don't plan to shoot this very much. I just fired it the once for the, uh, for the sake of argument just to say that I had fired it. I don't plan on shooting it a whole lot because I don't think these are the kind of handgun which really is going to stand up to an awful lot of shooting. But anyway, hopefully you enjoyed this video and like I said, a little bit of shooting footage coming up. And uh, thanks for watching.
Well, there's the Ivory Johnson 38 S and W from about uh, uh, 10 yards or so. One, two, three, four, five. No tack driver, but it would do the job.